Hello, I'm Dr. James Dilley, flint napper, bronze caster and experimental archaeologist. I'm here in Argyle, Scotland, in a landscape filled with prehistoric archaeology, visited by tourists from all over the world. Something has drawn people here to Kilmartin Glen for thousands of years, and their marks can still be seen today in the landscape in monuments made of stone. Humans have long felt the need to leave some kind of mark in the places they move through, from incredible frescoes on cave walls to modern graffiti stating they was here. Artwork on stone in later prehistoric Britain is often restricted to simple cut marks, but occasionally these cut marks are surrounded by concentric rings and pathways that connect them. This type of cup and ring marking can be seen here, elsewhere in Britain, and even across the world. There are few exceptions to this in later prehistoric Britain, but those few outliers perhaps give rare glimpses into an otherwise rather abstract world that can be quite hard to interpret. Alongside cup and ring markings, a new type of artwork begins to emerge. People start to depict objects. The most common object to appear was the flat metal axe, which was first made in copper before bronze. Images of flat axes can be seen inside the Recruine Cairn as well as other sites in Britain, such as Stonehenge and the Badbury Barrow. Providing a date for this kind of artwork is quite difficult because it's not coated in the same calcite layer that provides a date for Paleolithic artwork that can be found in calcium-rich limestone caves. And although it can be found on stones used to build kists like this, it's highly likely that these stones were once standing stones or markers of some kind before they were actually incorporated here into a tomb. I guess we can only really say that this type of artwork is early Bronze Age, based on the typology and from examples elsewhere. Now, the earliest copper appeared in Britain around 2400 BC, and that succeeded by bronze around 200 years later. Based on the style, these axes are probably flat axes, or even developed flat axes that have a slightly more flared blade to them. According to Needham's classification, these fall out of use around about 2200 BC, but it's also possible that this artwork actually depicts slightly later flanged axes, which come in around 2000 BC. But it's quite hard to tell the difference on a rock face as they're not going to be really accurate bits of artwork. Although the examples at Stonehenge do appear to show more clearly flanged axe typology. To spend the time carving and pecking out the shape of these tools showed they had a symbolic value to the people of the early Bronze Age, and clearly they were very valuable for the raw material alone. So you might think this type of axe rock art would be quite common in Britain, but it's not the case. And to add more confusion, there have been no flat axes of this type found here in the Glen. Why? Well, perhaps they were too valuable to lose or richly deposit in a tomb, or they haven't been found yet. To understand how these metal tools impacted people, we should really explore how they were made and the raw material sourced. It's highly likely that raw copper metal was brought here, or that finished axes found their way over here from Ireland. Now we know that some of these axes were made in Ireland because some of them have been sampled and matched to copper sources in Ireland using X-ray fluorescence. We can also see Irish influence beyond metal in the form of ceramics such as the Glebe Cairn pots which fit very snugly into the Irish food vessel type. There are lots of theories about how people came across copper metal and some are more credible than others. A lucky piece of copper ore that smelted in a pottery firing is rather unlikely, as copper ore must be heated to over a thousand degrees Celsius, and prehistoric pottery was typically only fired at seven to eight hundred degrees. 
far more likely a scenario is that the earliest metal tools in Europe were made from naturally occurring copper metal, also known as native copper. This can be cold forged into simple shapes such as a flat axe or tanged knife. People had been hitting materials to make tools for thousands of years prior, so this wouldn't have been unusual to them. Once made into copper tools, then used, like copper pipes in our homes, these early tools might have gained some oxidisation. People would have seen the connection between their copper tools turning a bit green and the heavy green rocks that come from the same place as the native copper. This would have been especially important as the native copper resource started to run dry. For anyone who's worked with metal, you'll know that even if you work it cold, it'll warm up as it's manipulated. And for people who would have been very familiar with changing a material with heat, such as clay or even heat treating flint, Heating this new native copper would have been a very sensible thing to try. With more heat and easier working, and then even more focused heat, it's likely someone eventually melted the copper and started the path to cast tools away from those made with percussion. With these discoveries, people will have almost certainly tried heating copper ore to the same temperature reached when native copper was melted and cast. And once they reached that point, the secret of smelting was unlocked. To cast an axe, you need a mould. And when the axe rock art was found here at Recreen and the Netherlagi cairns, it was suggested they might actually be moulds, but would be rather shallow. Now here is a selection of early Bronze Age moulds from Northern England and Scotland. And as you can see, they're generally deeper and far less stylized than the rock art. So these are probably not moulds for casting metal. To produce a mould for casting, a material is required that can both withstand great heat but perhaps more importantly, a material that can withstand sudden heat shock. Most open moulds that have been found are made from sedimentary rock, such as sandstone or a similar fine-grained material. Soapstone is another suitable rock for making moulds due to its softness that makes it easy to carve, but also its incredible resistance to heat that comes from its talc schist composition. Carving can be easily done with hard stone tools or early metal tools. Specialist tools are not needed for these simple moulds. The process of smelting copper depends on the type of ore and other elements present. If the ore is a simple oxide ore like malachite, it's a simple reduction process with charcoal that produces carbon monoxide. This takes oxygen from the ore, and assuming the furnace is hot enough, the copper metal can escape the ore in liquid form. Smelting and casting finished tools probably didn't happen in the same sequence due to the amount of slag and waste material that can be produced, which makes accurate casting trickier. Once a refined copper metal or blister copper is produced, it can be added together and melted down in a heavily grogged clay crucible. This can be cast into a preheated mould, almost certainly using wooden tongs to pick out and pour the copper. Once cast, the rough blank must be hammered and shaped into a lens profile so that the cutting edge or margin is centred. This hammering and shaping process would require a great deal of time and annealing by reheating and quenching to stop the metal becoming too brittle and cracking. As well as symbols of power, these axes were effective tools. Stone axes can snap and have to have thick cutting edge angles so that they're not too fragile but even a softer copper axe can have a much thinner edge that will bite far deeper into wood. Flat axes occasionally appear in burial assemblages as grave goods, suggesting they were valuable possessions. Symbolic representation on monuments in a world dominated by abstract art 
shows the impact of metal on these people over 4,000 years ago. But it's really hard to get to grips with the true impact of the first metals simply due to lack of supporting evidence. I'm often asked if metal workers were considered the first magicians for their power to pull shiny metal from stone. They were almost certainly valued craftspeople, but in the same way as the potter who could turn mud into beautiful ceramic vessels, or the textiler who could make soft clothing from plants we might usually try to avoid for their stings. Axes and axe artwork appears elsewhere in Bronze Age Europe, but often in stylized scenes, not as a direct representation of a single object. This in itself might show just how important these objects were alongside the occasional dagger artwork or other weapons. Even with this new material for their tools, and a huge cultural shift with this new material, Axes remained an important part of prehistoric life, both for their symbolism and usefulness as a tool. But that continues right through to the present day, where we see axes artistically represented in governance, regional flags, and sports teams logos. And even the sharpest steel axes of today, beloved by woodworkers and bushcrafters, started off life as stone. We take great pride in the videos produced for the Ancient Craft channel. We would really love to continue making more videos with new tutorials, site visits, artifact showcases and of course nap time. We have a Patreon account where you can support us in our efforts. There are competitions and replica artifact giveaways. Check it out here. And thank you to those who have already signed up. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already.